Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Let's get started. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to magnetism from now uh, onwards. And uh, I'd like to start by reminding you that in electricity, the fundamental observable uh, was that uh, there are two types of charges. So in electricity, the fundamental observable is that if you have two types of charges, or two charges, in fact, if they are of the same kind, either positive, both, or both negative, they will repel. And they will repel with a force that has been determined, and it is the Coulomb force. And based on that force, we define the electric field. On the other hand, if you have uh, different types of charges, they will attract. So this is the fundamental observable of electricity. And electricity, or to be more precise, electrostatics, is our, is our observation of uh, systems of static charges. Uh, the types of charges that we have seen uh, time and again, uh, surface charge densities, line charge densities, volume charge densities, and so on. The fundamental observable of magnetism is what is shown in this experiment here. And I'd like to emphasize this, that we observe magnetism by artificial means uh, in, for example, a system of two wires. So the fundamental observable is not really the one that you may be most familiar with in nature, that you have those magnets that can attract pieces of iron. This was indeed done in the ancient times. But now that we know a little bit more about magnetism, the fundamental observable is this one, that if you take two wires and you feed them in parallel so they have the same currents, then the wires will attract. If they have opposite currents, they will repel. So in fact, the first experiment is the repulsion. Opposite currents repel. Uh, Co-directional currents attract. So this is really the uh, observable that we should um, see. Okay, uh, that we should keep in mind uh, when we are thinking about magnetism as a, an analog to electricity. So here, the observable that we will try to uh, build upon. Let me just close. Here, this one is actually that if I have, and I will uh, use this uh, part of my board, that if I have two wires, I1 and I2, and the currents will be co-directional, then those wires will actually repel. And on the other hand, if those two currents are contradirectional, those two wires, sorry, will attract. And if the wires are contradirectional, sorry, the currents are contradirectional, then those two wires will repel. This is exactly what we see in magnetic levitation trains. where you have uh, a circuit that closes down the tracks and the current underneath the train is opposite to the current um, underneath the train is uh, opposite to the current on the tracks and then this repulsive force is strong enough to actually lift the train above the tracks. So this is the principle of magnetic levitation based on this fundamental observable of magnetism. And you may have naturally two questions. Question one, if these forces are there and they are strong enough to lift a train, why don't I observe them in the lab? You uh, work with closed circuits that have uh, those um, contradirectional currents all the time. So why don't you see them like in this demonstration uh, repel each other, the wires, I mean. Uh, 
What's that? Because they can neutralize by the environment. Neutralized by the environment? No, how can they be neutralized by the environment? Because unless you have strong currents, those forces, as we will see, are relatively small. And therefore, they can, easily counter, they can be easily counteracted by just taking a breadboard and sticking your circuit or your wires against the breadboard. You can very easily counteract those forces. They are relatively small. Of course, if you have a magnetic levitation train, then you have strong forces, strong currents, and then strong forces that they can even lift the train and enable this phenomenon of magnetic levitation. So many interesting applications of magnetism and all those uh, forces that we see related to the magnetic fields. The second question is the one that I will uh, leave pending for now and I will revisit later on, which naturally would be, if I generate magnetism by currents, then what happens in natural magnets? So that one we will revisit uh, later on. But this is the fundamental observable of magnetism. In electricity, and you will see that uh, I will build all the theory of magnetism based on what we have seen uh, in electricity. In electricity, we had this uh, Coulomb law that was telling us how much is this force between the two charges. And And we said back then that if we have charge Q1 and charge Q2, and these are point charges in the sense that their dimensions are much smaller than the dimensions uh, that we observe them from, and therefore we can consider them as point charges. And we assign to them position vectors R1 and R2, because now that they are point charges, they can be assigned position vectors just as any other ordinary points in space. The distance vector between the two from one to two is this one. So it is R2 minus R1. Then the force, the Coulomb force, that Q1 applies to Q2 in free space, so we observe this uh, whole system in vacuum is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q1, Q2, R2 minus R1 <coughs> cubed R2 minus R1. So basically the force is along the direction that uh, connects the two charges. And it will be either repulsive or attractive depending on whether the charges are um, like or opposite or unlike. If they are both positive, both negative, or the one is positive, the other is negative. We use this definition, uh, sorry, not this definition, we, uh, show, we use this law of experimental physics. This has been measured, epsilon naught is the dielectric permittivity of free space, to define what, anybody remembers, what do we use this law for to define what important quantity? The electric field. So the electric field that Q1 creates in the position of Q2 can be found basically by dividing out Q2. Then you are left with this expression that depends only on Q1 and, of course, the positions of the two. Okay. So this is now the electric field. The electric field that um, in volts per meter that Q1 creates in the position of Q2. So you see here that many times we think of fields as abstract things. However, the way that we define them is based on observables, experimental observables, and the easiest thing to experimentally be observed and measured is a force. So we have the Coulomb force and then we define the electric field likewise. So in magnetism, we have again a force. And for that force, 
So in electricity, this was the Coulomb force and the Coulomb force law that allowed us to define the field. In magnetism, the corresponding law of experimental physics that again has been uh, measured and uh, proven through measurement is the Ampere force law. And Ampere really through a set of detailed experiments was able to determine the force between the magnetic counterparts of the point charges. And here in magnetism you see we have wires. So instead of defining a point charge, we define an elementary current, a differentially small current. So if you imagine this wire with the current I1 and this wire with the current I2, those can be seen as consisting of differentially small elements. So I can go and define here a small piece of the wire that uh, is defined through this length element dl1 and carries current i1 and another piece here i2 dl2. We know that there is a force between those two. And that force, the force that is being uh, applied by current I1 on current I2, that is this small element of uh, the wire I1 on this small element of the wire I2. Again, because these are differentially small, I can define point, uh, sorry, position vectors for both R1 and R2. Uh, so you see again now this uh, vector here is R2 minus R1 is the distance vector between those two. So you see the, 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 the analogy between electricity and magnetism. In electricity we had big charge distributions that might be on a, a line, might be on a surface, might be on a volume. And then we were breaking them down to point charges. And for point charges, we have the Coulomb force law. Here, you have current distributions. You break them down to elementary currents, IDL. And then the force, again, I will use the same notation from 1 to 2. The force from 1 to 2 will be given by regrettably a much more complicated expression now than the Coulomb force law, that will be I2 DL2 and now I have a cross product with an expression that I will put in brackets and it is mu naught by 4 pi I1 DL1 and then from this point on the terms look pretty much like the Coulomb force terms cubed. Okay. So here you see a vector uh, operator that is the cross product that enters in this expression and that basically means that uh, the force that we observe will be perpendicular to both the first current and this expression right here. We will see uh, more specifically how this uh, uh, plays out in different uh, uh, specific examples. Before I get there, let me just uh, bring up the analogies. So you see here we have the victim, the victim charge of this force, if you wish, I can call this, uh, I can uh, call this the victim of the force, that is the receiver, the recipient of that force from, uh, from charge one, uh, Q2 right here. So in this case, the recipient of the force is, is this one. It's the second current, I2 DL2. Uh, 
in this case, whatever remains from this expression is actually the field. Here, we have something that, again, can be put in brackets and depends only on I1, DL1. However, we have also this cross product. So that will actually make our calculation a little bit more complicated. But what is here inside the brackets is actually called the magnetic flux density, B, that is generated by I1 DL1 at the position of the second current. And this part of the Ampere force law is actually having its own name. It's the Biot-Savar law. So this uh, equation here is by itself the Biot-Savar law that basically tells us what is the magnetic field of an elementary current generated at an observation point. That is a very important formula that uh, we can use to do calculations like magnetic field from a power line. You know, there were uh, many um, references in the pertinent literature correlating magnetic fields, low frequency magnetic fields, to child leukemia, long term exposure to low frequency magnetic fields to child leukemia. As a result, there are government limits on the exposure to magnetic fields. How do you calculate having a wire? How do you calculate the magnetic field that is being generated? A wire from a power line, from a telephone line? This is really the recipe. And it is very, very similar to how the uh, Coulomb law works. So let me give you an example. Or before the example, um, any questions up to this point? Questions? Yes, please. So the question is uh, whether I will integrate or not. Right now, there is nothing to integrate. The, what I uh, actually calculated is the force between those two elementary wires, not the entire wire. If I had the entire wire, then I would integrate. And I will do that right now. So um, I will get there in a moment. Any other questions? Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, Ampere force law already incorporated by Alex That's right. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that won't be obvious if you follow some textbooks, but uh, it is indeed, that is the historic uh, evolution of these concepts. So, it's all based on experiments. So, here's an example. Uh, which happens to be very similar to the first example I did in Coulomb's law. So the example is a very classical calculation, standard calculation for magnetic fields. That is, uh, you have a current. That current is along the z-axis. So it is, uh, imagine that it is a wire. That carries constant current I. And I want to find the magnetic flux density B. And by the way, I should uh, say here that the units are Tesla. Uh, of course, uh, in honor of Nikola Tesla, uh, the prolific uh, physicist and engineer uh, who worked a lot on magnetic fields and had uh, this uh, uh, vision that has now become, uh, has become a little bit more fashionable than it used to be of having those uh, towers that would distribute power through the magnetic field. Uh, 
so they would generate uh, strong magnetic fields. So instead of having wires uh, to transmit power uh, from um, power stations to homes, you would have those uh, big stations that would generate strong magnetic fields, and then everybody would pick up their power wirelessly. And uh, right now, you may know that there are even uh, companies that sell you such systems. Uh, they are not operating at uh, low frequency magnetic fields as uh, Tesla uh, envisioned. Uh, right now, we know that this would be uh, actually very risky uh, health-wise, but they are operating at uh, higher frequencies, including millimeter waves. They are not doing tasks like powering up homes, but they can do tasks like uh, you place your cell phone on your table and uh, the system can point a beam of uh, millimeter waves that can start charging your, your cell phone. So uh, this is uh, a vision that started by Nikola Tesla and uh, a patent that he, he also has. We will uh, talk about this uh, later in the course when we get to transformers. So this is uh, our problem for now, that we have an observation point here and we want to find how much is the magnetic field. And the observation point is totally arbitrary. So I'd like to emphasize that Biot-Savart law is very similar in terms of the methodology to Coulomb's law. Very similar. So the first step that we had said back then from Coulomb's law was that, anybody remembers? The chunk, before we take the chunk is, yes? The coordinate system, that's right. So which coordinate system? Or choose coordinate system. Uh, this one here, just like uh, the line charge density along the z-axis, has obvious cylindrical symmetry. So therefore, I will use the cylindrical coordinate system. So same arguments as the line charge density along the z-axis. Same kind of, same thinking process. So I'm choosing to work in cylindrical coordinates. Second, as your classmate said, is find not the DQ now, but the IDL. So break down this wire into small elementary currents. And this is uh, should not be too difficult to do here, that we imagine a small current, ideal primed along the wire, I will call it again ideal primed because, as you remember, uh, I, will be uh, I was using prime coordinates for the sources in Coulomb's law. And I will do this again here. So now this is on the z-axis. So therefore, this dl primed will be dz primed z hat. So this answers the question, what is this dl primed? This dl primed is a vector, the magnitude will be the differential length element. Again, you refer to your aid sheet to find those differential length elements. Here I am moving along the z-axis, so therefore dl will be dz. Because I'm talking about sources, it will be dz primed. And it will point in the direction of the current flow. And this is the fundamental difference now with charges. Charges are static, they, they, they are somewhere. They don't have any direction, they have only sign. Here you have also the direction of the current. And in this case, I have a current that uh, flows along the z-axis. So this is my dl primed. And the position of that uh, 
uh, I call the position vector of this R prime, just as I did in Coulomb's law. And again, if you refer to your uh, aid sheet, you will see that in cylindrical coordinates, the position vector is expressed as this. But now I am on the z-axis. I am on the z-axis. And on the z-axis, r primed is 0, because this r primed measures the distance from the z-axis its cylindrical coordinate. And therefore, this is 0 here, because ideal primed is on the z-axis. So that is the only th uh, part of this expression that remains active here. You can imagine the coordinate system is somewhere here. The origin is somewhere here, the 0, 0, 0. So the position vector is this vector. It has to be aligned with the z-axis. OK, so this is it. So now the third step is find the magnetic flux density due to this ideal primed. So now I call this dB because I am asked to find the total magnetic flux of the entire wire. So I anticipate that there will be an integration step at the end. So therefore, I'm not interested, like in here, in the magnetic field of that small element. I'm interested in the entire magnetic field. So I will call this dB, that is the magnetic flux density only due to this one. Where at the observation point? And the observation point has a position vector that is not primed because it is, it has to be fixed. And again, through my office hours that were not very popular, of course, not very busy before the exam, I noticed still that there was some confusion about, about this thing. But remember what we do in superposition. We break down the sources into either point charges or now point currents. And then we integrate their effect on a fixed observation point. The observer won't move. And again, when we were doing those uh, power lines, I gave the example of calculating whether the electric field in a schoolyard is safe or not, meets the safety standards of the government or not, uh, ba based on the, on, a, on the field that is generated by a power line. So similar thing now that we're talking about the magnetic field of a power line. And the magnetic field due to the current now on the power line. What do we do? We have to find the field that every point on the power line will generate at the schoolyard. We won't be moving the schoolyard around the city. We'll be moving the sources so that we find their effect on the schoolyard. Right? So the observation point stays fixed. And what is moving, what is being integrated, in other words, and what is being integrated is primed, is actually uh, the sources, the source uh, coordinates. So the position vector is, I'm being told everywhere. So I take the position vector in cylindrical coordinates and I write it here. That's it. Okay. So now, because I'm not as smart as you guys or the uh, textbook, I want to do things step by step. So I look at this formula and I will calculate every part of this formula step by step. So you see dB will be mu naught, and uh, I uh, have mentioned before what is mu naught, but I will repeat it now. Um, R minus R prime cube. And I should say here that uh, mu naught and sorry, I didn't mention this before. I think I have introduced it at some point in previous lectures. Is the magnetic permeability of free space so it is the magnetic analog of epsilon naught that we saw in Coulomb's law. 
and uh, the value is 4 pi times 10 to minus 7. The units are Henry that you know from uh, circuits courses per meter. So we will uh, also get to uh, exactly those uh, units uh, later on. But for now, I'm just uh, giving you the value and uh, the units. So this is a dB, and now I will go and calculate this num numerator and denominator separately, step by step, so that I don't make any mistake. So first of all, R minus R primed, you see I am uh, uh, subtracting those two vectors, R R hat plus Z minus Z primed Z hat. Length of this magnitude is you take the, the two components, you square them, you add them up, you take the square root. And finally, I have to run this cross product. So I take my IDL. And now I have the R minus R prime, which I have calculated from before. And at this point, I'd like to uh, open a small parenthesis and uh, And say a few things about these cross products, because many times these are a bit confusing. First of all, cross products between uh, the same vector, x cross x, y cross y, z cross z, is equal to 0. So whenever you have cross products that involve the same unit vectors, In any coordinate system, all these are zero. So when I will take the cross product z cross z, that will actually give me zero. So there is nothing, uh, there is uh, no result of, of this uh, cross product. Now, what about cross products between vectors uh, that are different? For the Cartesian system, let me give you this uh, small trick. And I think I have learned this from Professor Ullaby, actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if you want to calculate x cross y, you go in this array and you say x cross y, the next element here is z. The next element is to the right, so x cross y is equal to z. y cross z, you can find it here. So the next element is x, so y cross z is equal to x. Now someone tells you what is z cross y. So these are the small rules that uh, will come in handy in this particular step where you do the cross product. So you go here, you see that z cross y is formed by moving to the left. The next part is x, and because now you are moving to the left, you put a minus sign. Okay, so this is the Cartesian part. More interesting, the cylindrical part. Same way with R phi Z, you write them like this. R phi Z. So for example, phi cross Z is equal to R. Which one do we have here? Z cross R, it is right here. 
z cross r will give you phi. z cross phi, you are moving to the left, gives you minus r. And just to complete this picture in the spherical coordinates, same applies, the order of the vectors is r theta phi. So this little note will come in handy at this particular step where I now calculate the cross product. So then the cross product, just to continue out of this parenthesis, will be I dz primed. You see the first cross product will be z cross r. I have it somewhere here. Uh, will be phi hat. And the second will be zero. So I will have just one term. I r dz primed in the phi direction. So this is it. So now I have everything I need and I put it back together. And my db is mu naught by four pi. Uh, I r dz primed uh, phi hat, and notice that this phi hat is not phi hat prime or something. It came from the, the r hat unit vector, the, the observer. So I haven't missed any uh, primed uh, vectors. And underneath uh, here, I have, uh, and sorry, I have also. Uh, Ideal. Underneath here, I have r squared plus z minus z prime squared, three halves. Okay? So now I am ready for the last step, which is the integration. Before that, any questions? Questions? If you go back to uh, your notes, for the uh, line charge density, you will see that we have very, very similar terms. And in fact, the last step is the integration. To find the total magnetic field. So I integrate. What do I integrate? There is just one differential element here to integrate. That is the dz prime. That has to be integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, so under, uh, outside uh, the integral, I leave all the constants, which are the phi hat, the mu naught, i, 4 pi, r. And inside, I have this integral that will run from minus infinity to plus infinity, dz primed, r squared plus z minus z prime squared, 3 halves. We have seen this same integral in the case of a, the line charge density. The value of this is 2 over r. And uh, finally, that will give you a magnetic flux that is mu naught i by, two, so, sorry, 2 r squared uh, by 2 pi r. So the r and the r squared cancel out, and you have a mu naught i by 2 pi r as the magnetic flux density. So in other words, the magnetic field is actually circulating around the current. Or if you want to see it in a cross section, if the current comes out of the board, if we uh, observe this on the xy plane, and this is the current. So this dot basically means that the current is coming out of the board. The magnetic flux lines are actually circulating like this.
Okay? So this is the magnetic field, the magnetic flux density that is being generated by this current. And uh, compare this to the electric field. So remember if we had uh, a line like this charged with positive charges, the electric field was pointing radially outwards from the charged wire. So the electric field was rho L by 2 pi R R hat uh, by epsilon naught, sorry. R hat. So this was the electric field. Here, the magnetic field is, you see, instead of the denominator, this is in the numerator, mu naught, 2 pi. Instead of rho L, we have the current and then the 1 over R dependence. So these are indeed dual relations, uh, but we have this fundamental difference that the electric field lines are open. As you remember, positive charges are sources of electric fields. Negative charges are sinks of electric fields. In this pattern of the magnetic field, you can actually not identify any source or sink. The magnetic flux lines are uh, closed. So this brings me to a fundamental postulate of magnetism that we, what we are observing here is actually not coincidental. The magnetic flux lines are always closed. So the, the uh, fundamental postulate is, can be stated as follows. Magnetic flux lines are always closed. And can be stated in terms of Gauss's law for magnetism a little bit more formally. You remember Gauss's law for electricity. Gauss's law for electricity was saying that the electric flux density over a closed surface is equal to the enclosed charge. Okay, that was the Gauss's law for electricity. In magnetism, there is actually no counterpart of the electric charge. So despite the fact that we will see many analogies between electricity and magnetism, there is one thing that we cannot find an analogy, and that is the electric charge. So we cannot identify a magnetic charge, so to speak. And therefore, Gauss's law for magnetism is actually that if you take this B dot ds, no matter what surface you will choose, the left-hand side will be always zero. And that also means that the divergence of the magnetic flux will always be zero. And as a result, no matter what system you are observing, you will be finding always closed lines. If you ever do a calculation, you find open lines, you are violating this fundamental postulate of magnetism. And what does that mean physically? It means that we don't have magnetic charges. We don't have an analog of the magnetic charge. In other words, if you take a magnet if you take a bar magnet and you try to break it in half, hoping that you will isolate the North Pole from the South Pole, in fact, you won't be able to do it. You can, I don't know if you can try it, but 
uh, if you try it, you will see that you are generating, by breaking it, you are generating two new magnets. And if you try to break those, uh, you will generate another two new magnets. So you won't be able to isolate a magnetic monopole or a magnetic charge that would play the role of a source or a sink of the magnetic flux lines. And if you have no source nor sink, then there is only one possibility, that the lines will be closing upon themselves, and they will be closed just like you see them right there in uh, the magnetic field that we just calculated. Any questions? Yes. Can you go over the fact where you took, uh, took the cost flow for magnetism? Why is it like exactly zero? I understand there is no magnetic charge. Yes. But is there any other way to interpret the like, uh, like, like closed circles that you've drawn down? So the question is, uh, how do I know that this is zero? So this is the fundamental postulate. I'm postulating that. And the only proof is experiment. Uh, and this is one very good example of what we are doing here. We're not doing mathematics. We're not doing mathematics. If someone manages to isolate a magnetic monopole in the lab, then we will change the course and we'll put in something on the right-hand side to represent that. And from time to time, there are many groups, including here in physics, that announce that they have isolated a magnetic monopole. And, but unfortunately, none of these announcements has been proven to be a sustainable way of isolating and provable way and reproducible way of isolating magnetic monopoles. But if someone does isolate, then we will be seeing magnetic flux lines coming out of that magnetic monopole. So this is postulate. It's not something that I can prove to you. And then once I say that this holds, then the divergence of B is zero, that means that there is no flux or sink, so this uh, uh, field has to have lines that close upon themselves. Otherwise, it would be non-zero at the point where it actually emerges or at the negative at the point where it sinks. So it has to be zero, that means no sink, no uh, source. Okay, so finally, now that we have the field, we can find also uh, the force. That's, that is, if I put another wire, so if I have here this uh, I1 and I bring in another wire, I2, at a distance D, what will be the force? The Ampere force law tells me that I can calculate the force on an element IDL due to the magnetic flux B by taking the cross product. So now that I know the magnetic field of this uh, wire, so I know that there will be this magnetic field here from the first wire, I can calculate the force that the first wire applies to the second wire. I will do it again element by element. That is, I break this into small wires So I take a small element, I2 dz z hat, and I'm asking myself, how much force will it receive? The Ampere force law says that the force uh, only on this element will be given by the cross product between I2 dz z hat and the magnetic flux I just calculated. The magnetic flux will be a five vector so you see the cross product I'm about to do is a cross product between a z vector and the phi hat unit vector. So the magnetic flux is actually piercing the board like this at the position of the wire. So it is equal to phi hat nu naught I1 by 2 pi. The distance now is d. So this is it. And uh, Z cross phi, I have it somewhere there. 
z cross phi will be minus r hat. dz. So you see that we have a per unit length force that is given by this formula here. And you see that when i1, i2 is positive, that is if you have co-directional currents, the force points in the minus r hat direction. So it is indeed attractive. And on the other hand, if I1, I2 is negative, then the false force is repulsive. So here we close the loop that indeed what we calculated is consistent with the fundamental observable that if you have those currents that are co-directional, then they will have uh, an attractive force. If they are contra-directional, then they will have a repulsive force. And that is it for today. I will stick around if there are any questions, and otherwise uh, I will see you uh, on Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>